Well, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending on where you're watching from, listening from, tuned in from. Uh, great to see you uh, all again. Not that I can see you, but you can see me. And uh, here we are once more to talk about a Burgundian subject. I'll weave in one or two other things at the same time. Uh, we can talk about how the 2020 vintage is progressing because it got underway at the beginning of this week. But we're going to focus on uh, a part of the coat that hasn't really started picking yet, which is the southern part of the Cote de Nuit. If you remember, if you joined us before, we did uh, from Maurice Saint Denis up through Jovry Chambertin, Marcinet, Fissin, and so on. We've done as far, we've done Chablis, we've, and Puy Fuisse, we've done the Cote de Bone in reds and whites. And the one area that we haven't really covered so far uh, in our peregrinations around Burgundy is the southern half of the Cote de Nuit. So that's Nuit Saint-Georges, Vaune Romane, uh, and indeed Chambon Musny as well. And uh, that's what we're going to look at. We'll probably take it from north to south. And what I hope to do today is we can look at the vineyards, we can look at what's happening now, and we can look at uh, <coughs> who the exciting producers are, who the up and coming producers are. So we just had a friendly uh, good evening, welcome uh, from Jamal. Uh, and if everybody else, uh, do please use the chat as much as you like. Um, I will. Also add a little something now. And, uh, and also don't be afraid to ask questions on the Q&A. Uh, and I will endeavor to weave them into uh, the fabric of what I'm talking about and or answer them at the end. So I think it will probably last about an hour this evening. So uh, the other thing I'm gonna to try to do, uh, and I don't guarantee that I shall succeed. Uh, yes, when you join in, please do say where, you, where you're coming from as well. So, uh, hello from Chicago and from Shreveport and all over the place. Great. So, what I'm going to try to do uh, uh, as, as much as I can is to manage myself the, uh, the maps. Uh, so, you should now be able to see, uh, as well as me, you should be able to see also the map of. Uh, my screen has gone dark. Okay. So, let's hope that, uh, that that's going to work. Um, for some reason, I'm getting some nasty messages on my screen. I don't know what it doesn't like, but it doesn't like something. If need be, I will hand over to Scott to do that. Scott, I'm going to stop sharing. Perhaps you could give me the Chambon Musny uh, map instead. I don't know what you could see, uh, everybody who's tuned in, but my screen kept flashing off um, between the map and going blank. Right, so let's take a look at, uh, we'll get rid of me and we'll have um, Chambon Musny. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, if we can maybe zoom in one more on that, Scott. That would be good. Um, so I'm a little bit worried about, um, Graham, thank you, uh, Chambon Musny at the moment because I think it's one of the villages along with Volnay, uh, I would have talked about when we did the Cote de Bone, that is suffering a little bit from uh, the heat. Um, and I noticed this in 2018. For example, there is one producer who has got two different parts of Bon Mar, and he harvested uh, one unbelievably early. In fact, today, two years ago, 22nd of August, uh, and uh, the other bit he harvested on the 27th of August, you know, which, which, which scarcely makes sense uh, at all for a, a vineyard like Bon Mar. But he felt he had to because the grapes were, were getting roasted, uh, the skins were going wrinkled, and even though he could tell that otherwise, physiologically, the grapes weren't ripe, it was a question of pick them or lose them. Uh, so he went ahead and did that. And it's a great producer. I love the, the other wines, uh, most of the other wines he made in 2018, but I didn't get on with the Bon Mar. And he wasn't alone. Quite a few people in Chambol Musny or outside Actually, it was more often the people from outside Chambol uh, who made it, uh, find it difficult to make it work. This producer was outside Chambol. Um, so whenever I was tasting, as it might be in a negotiation or in Bone, and we, we went from one village to another, often the Chambol was the weak link. Whereas the people based in Chambol, who could see what was going on, could manage it directly from their, from, from the, from their front door, as it were, uh, there, were there were fewer failures. Even so, one or two times I thought, hmm, that's borderline. 
So I haven't yet tasted any 2019s in Chambord. I, I started doing a bit of tasting, but I've mostly been in satellite areas. Um, and it'll be interesting to see what happened. Uh, broadly speaking, the people who suffered in 18 seem to have done well in 19. And the people who breezed through 18 and thought, well, whatever the problems are, they don't affect me, had a couple of nasty shots when it came to 2019. Now we'll see what 2020 will do. And um, as I say, I've been looking at grapes coming in in the Cote de Bone. Hardly anyone has started picking in the Cote de Nuit. And in the Cote de Bone, they've probably started uh, by trying to rescue anything that looked a little bit doubtful. Uh, broadly speaking, they're going for the reds first, but there are, most people who have both are picking some of each. And they're pretty excited about the whites. Uh, and the reds uh, is a little bit more variable. But those who haven't been, we'll call it heat struck, uh, also look good. And the yields are not as good as was first expected back in the late spring when a really good crop set, but better than was expected a couple of weeks ago when it looked as though drought was really taking over. There's a lot more juice in the berries in the same way that there also was in 2018. And again, I suspect in both vintages, the same reason, uh, which is that. Um, uh, there was such very, very good um, uh, rain, or good, there was so much rain uh, during the winter that it's actually kept the vines supplied. And very pleasing was that from 9.30 last night through 3 o'clock this morning, it was fairly heavy rainfall. And for once, uh, growers really, really want rain, even though it's uh, at the beginning of the harvest. So that's a very brief update 2020. Uh, more next week. Next week, we're going to talk about little bit about 2019 I've seen so far. I will give you a much more thorough update on the 2020 harvest and we're going to take a look at burgundy pricing um, because for many people it has got completely uh, out of hand and we want to know why that might be and what's going to happen from here on in. It's, it's a quite a complex subject, it's not a straightforward you know what are these clowns doing, why is everybody being so greedy, there are a lot more subtleties than that. Right, Chambord Musigny. So um, here you can see the map. And you've got the two Grand Cru's. You've got the Bon Mar over on the right-hand side, and Musigny, various forms, or just Musigny, over on the left, uh, adjacent to the Clos de Vucho. Uh, in between, at the sort of mid-height um, contour level, if you like, uh, halfway up the slope, you've got all the Premier Cru's, um, and then you've got in green, you've got the village vineyards, which as almost always, either at the bottom of the slope or hovering around the top or just slightly tucked away. So uh, this sector over here, uh, it's not just that it's higher up because as you can see, it's no higher than Bon Mar or Crau Fue, uh, but it's tucked in behind the village. Actually, the, the ground goes a little bit down in that sector. Um, and uh, probably uh, there are some very good wines from here, but it's not the most famous part of Chambord Musigny. Um, originally, uh, well, we've got, as well as Bon Mar and Musigny, of course, we've got Amarez, and effectively that's a Grand Cru as well. Uh, it is in price, so, so we'll, we'll count it as a Grand Cru and have a little look about which other Premier Cru is going up and which are going down in the current way of looking at it. And I think on the whole that in past days, Charm would have been the next best known uh, Premier Cru here. It's on a little plateau, it's actually not completely, it hasn't totally um, uh, uh, flattened down. Uh, no, Miriam, there's not really a difference between the two parts of Le Charm. They're all on the same plateau. Um, what's a bit more interesting, it's an anomaly, and I don't know why it is. I thought, first of all, it was the tease by Sylvain Pitié to catch people out. But you can see there's a bit of the Premier Cru plant there, and there's a bit of Premier Cru plant there, and they are separated by Charm. And how they both come to be called plant, well, normally you say, ah, I'm going to live plant, meaning I'm going to the most recently replanted bit of the vineyard. So that's probably the origin of the name. Um, and we've got another weirdo uh, here, which is Le Grand Mur, which even though there is a vineyard called Le Grand Mur, the authorities don't want you to use that name. They want you to make it as part of first lot, which is how most people declare it. But uh, Gilbert Felletig wanted to call it Grand Mur and was, had his wrist slapped and was told he shouldn't. And you will also notice uh, just here that there is a white blob, that's actually the cemetery. And as far as I can tell, 
Chamois Musny is the only village in the Côte de which has a cemetery actually in Premier Crew vineyard land. So uh, some consolation, I suppose, when, you, when it's your time. There's one vineyard, and I'm thinking with our friends at 67 Pall Mall of maybe doing a uh, Zoom just on this vineyard. Um, and uh, here it is, La Combe d'Orve, um, which is Premier Crew here, it's village here, and down here, it's Grand Cru Musigny. So it's got all three of the main classifications. And there's going to be some clever clogs on the chat, I'm pretty sure, who is going to tell us there's actually a fourth bit, because there's also, I believe, some um, straight Bourgogne generic, which also is called Combe d'Orve. Um, so I won't, we won't do that. But anyway, I really like Combe d'Orve. Um, Bruno Clavelier, he's got some, says that his, his grandfather uh, re always reckoned that it wasn't uh, made as Grand Cru because they didn't want to pay the uh, additional taxes. This is a, a theme you hear from time to time, right, Burgundy? And that in fact, it's pretty much the same soil as the Petit Musigny, and so why shouldn't it be Grand Cru? Well, I'm not quite sure about that, but it is a very distinguished vineyard, uh, and it is um, actually one of my, one of my real favourites. Um, and also, um, I would like to single out up here, uh, Les Crats and Les Fuets, um, which higher up the hill, to begin with, the first benefit of global warming was to see the quality going up the hill and Crown Fuet really came into it. Fuet is not that dissimilar from, from Bonmar in style. Whereas Cra is a pure mineral limestone style. Cra is a little bit more Chamon Musigny and Fue makes you start thinking, as do Bode and Sontier, these chaps down here. They make, and Bonmar, of course, itself, they make you start thinking about Maurice Saint Denis uh, in style. Uh, in terms of producers in Chambol, um, there are three sort of superstars, if you like, one of which uh, is a, a little bit. Um, in abeyance possibly at the moment, I think probably unfairly, and that's Domaine de Vogue. Reason being it had such a magnificent reputation, A, a long time ago, and B, when the new team took over uh, at the end of the 80s, um, being Francois Millet in the cellar, Jean-Luc Pepin um, in, uh, in sort of sales office, if you like, and uh, Eric Bourgoyne in the vineyards. Um, and people got really excited through the 90s. And then they found that the wines weren't delivering. And I think it's not that the wines are being badly made. I think it's just they're being made in a style which goes quiet for a very long time. And I'm finding some of those years, the 91, for example, and even 10 years later, the 2001, uh, have started to blossom. So I, I, I think there is uh, the quality that we hope for all there, but it's missing the sex appeal until the wines get, get fully mature. Uh, another of the top names, um, uh, of course, is Frédéric Munier in the Chateau de Chambon Musigny. So uh, that is just, ooh, let's have a look, just there, that would be his first. Hang on, we'll give him a heart, because the heart show up better. Um, who uh, can be absolutely magnificent wines. I adore his Chambon Musigny and the Premier Cru Fue, and of course the Musigny. They can be quite discreet also. They can sometimes not totally show when, they, when they're young. And of course, Fred has done this wonderful thing of re removing the musigny from the marketplace until it's at least five years old. So 2013 hasn't yet appeared on sale. Um, the reason being that uh, he just doesn't want people to spend a large amount of money on a top class wine and drink it either at home or, or in a restaurant way too early and not get the enjoyment from it. Um, I've never been quite as much of a fan of his Bon Mar, but I do really love his wine from out of town that he's made since 2004 vintage, the Nuit Saint-Georges uh, Claude La Maréchale. And right next door to him, making wine in not, not that dissimilar way, but a lot of the same vineyards, uh, is Christophe Rumier, who has moved from star to superstar. Something he doesn't really like himself in so far, I mean, obviously he's pleased that people are enjoying his wines, um, but he doesn't like to be put on a pedestal. He doesn't like to be, um, doesn't, certainly doesn't like any more than Fred does, having his wines changing hands at enormously expensive prices. Um, 
but uh, every time I taste the wines, whether it's the basic Bourgogne or, or anything above, uh, I do find them wonderful. In fact, I bumped into him yesterday morning, uh, the day before rather, when I was going out to do some tasting in uh, Massonneau and Fissin, and I was driving through uh, on the, sort of the vineyard road rather than the main road, and, um, and there he was down in his new block of Echezo, which he's just got, which in fact is right next door to the Musée of Jacques Brieur here. It's the very next bit. It's slightly down in a dip, um, but a couple of years now, he, he got it in 2016. Uh, uh, Arnaud Morte, Domaine Denis Morte, has got the first um, part of the block, then Christophe, and then the Chateau de Marcenet. Uh, overall, it was half a hectare, which uh, I think through coffee, uh, with their investors uh, purchased. Um, it was pre previously made by Dominique Mignoret and it's gone to those three producers I've just mentioned. Anyway, I bumped him into him in the vineyards. He wasn't planning to start until uh, the end of this week at the earliest uh, or into next week um, uh, because even though uh, some of the leaves are just beginning to fade away on the vines, when you taste the grapes, the tannins are not yet ripe. But he's not a he's not a late picker either, so he won't be too long. Right uh, then, under those three names, another real favourite of mine uh, is uh, Gislaine Barteau, uh, who is if I put it right, is located just there, uh, and she is I mean she's not retired retired, but she's pretty much from 2019 handed over the vinification to her son Clément. Uh, and he's also taken over his dad's uh, winery. So there are, there are actually two separate domains in the same place, uh, Domaine Chislaine Bateau and Domaine Louis Boyer. And their son, Clément, is making both. He's going to keep the two domains separate. A few things behind the scenes, the various, they have about six different companies for land holding this, that, and the other. They may, may be going to amalgamate those, but they will retain the separate labels. Um, so they also come into the category of top domains. Um, Cudelot Bay, I haven't got to for a little while, uh, just there, uh, but I think is very, very good. Um, their wines to begin with were a tiny bit firm, but they have uh, got steadily better. Um, Amio Servelle, who I might not have it exactly right, but I think are there. New generation involved there with the daughter Prune during um, the winemaking and son Antoine, I think he is uh, more involved in the marketing side of things. Gilbert and uh, Christine Salatig uh, are based here and I have a very high regard for them. Um, you see Gilbert and he looks like a really unreconstructed um, uh, Burgundian, sort of larger figure. Um, Burgundians are supposed to have um, flat heads according to um, the historian Theodore Zeldin, and uh, he's one of those, actually Christophe Rumier too for that matter. Um, uh, shouldn't make comments like this, and it's of course completely irrelevant to either people's character or brain power, but he just looks one of those really typical stockily built um, paysan Burgundians, but he is extremely um, interesting to listen to, uh, very fluent talking about his wines, and though I personally might use a touch less new oak, I think it's one of the exciting domains. Um, I don't know, um, but they're on my visiting list coming up, uh, Sega, uh, Sigo rather, and um, Sigo uh, quite as well as I would like to. Um, and that would hold true also of uh, Francois Berthaud, uh, Michel de Joyeux-Royer, um, the Borso brothers, uh, Laurent uh, Rumier, but uh, you know they're all making decent wines. Uh, I particularly like the village old vine Fremier Cuvée from De Joya Roy, for example. Um, but that I think pretty much covers it. So that's a dozen, thirteen names for Chambord Musnier. That's all they are. They get on well together. They've just taken the uh, radical decision of changing the officers, the council of the ODG, which is the technical name for the, the local village council. So all the 60 year olds are out and uh, I think it's now being run by Justine Clerge. I didn't mention because I'm going to talk to her about her later when we put um, Vougeot and Chile Cito. But actually, you can see this here where I put the heart is um, the village of um, uh, Vougeot. So we think of the growers coming from there. 
but on that side of the road, it's actually inside Chambon Musni. So it includes um, Hulo Nola, and on this side of the road is, which is in Chili Les Cito, but the winery is on the other side, is Clerget. And so Justine Clerget, uh, son of uh, Chez Robles and uh, Clement Boyot, or maybe a fourth. So people in their 20s basically have taken over running Chambon Musni. So it's all quite exciting. Um, Miriam was just asked about the 2008 vintage Chambon Musni. Um, I remember 2006 was the year that I didn't really like in Chambol. 2007 was more successful here than in most other villages, partly because Christophe Rumier plays an absolute blinder. 2008, I don't think I've drunk one very recently, but my memory is positive uh, rather than otherwise. I have to go back and, and check a few notes. Okay, i um, uh, got to parcel out the time fairly, so I think we, we're done on. Uh, oh yes, a question from somebody, is there a piece of Bon Mar in Clos de Tar? Uh, there was, um, in so far as that Bon Mar, it goes over the boundary into Murray Saint Denis, and in fact on the sort of cadastral map, it went even a little bit further than uh, this line here, which marks the end of Bon Mar. It did go into Clos de Tar, uh, it won't be as wide as that strip, um, but they then decided that, that was silly and complicated matters, so they uh, they removed that and uh, and it's no longer part of the cadastral idea. But the actual uh, vineyard of Bon Mar, um, it's purely a question of names on a map, the vineyard itself didn't extend into Clos uh, Cl de Tar, because there's always been that wall, well, always seven, eight hundred years there's been the wall there, guarding the boundaries, but thank you for the question. Okay, uh, I haven't done the map of um, uh, Vougeot. Uh, you can actually see it slightly backed out uh, here. Uh, so you've got Vougeot itself, you've got uh, three, four, um, you've got Petit Vougeot, Claude de la Perrière, La Vigne Blanche, Les Croix uh, are the premier crews. La Vigne Blanche is better known as the Claude Blanc de Vougeot, of course, it's a wonderful wine, white wine of Domaine de la Vougeret. And you've got almost no village wine. Um, it's just called Le Village, but you, it's the Clos du Priere of Domaine de la Rougere, it's the Clos du Village that Ben Leroux makes, uh, probably one or two other people, but you hardly ever see um, Le Village. But I've had some super petit Rougeau, uh, this vineyard um, here, from E.G. Fourier, from Hulot Nala. I'm forgetting another one who also makes really good petit Rougeau, but it's um, uh, in the reds, uh, I, I, I've seen some really nice wines. One thing to mention is what appears and shows on this map as um, it looks as though the Vujo vineyards go right up to the road here. But you've got two tiny plots of Musnier which are the wrong side of the road. One was a bit of scrubland recently converted, the other has been vineyard for a while longer, but they both are actually part of the Musnier and they are both now owned by um, Dwayne Tours. Pascal Marchand and uh, Marie Tours' business. Uh, right, um, the only other thing I'd say about Vujo, uh, where you've only got the producers you've got in the village, uh, I've already said uh, Hulot Nola, Clerget, and here is the Chateau de la Tour, um, making the uh, quite exciting cuvées, including the Pied Vine and a special homage cuvée uh, entirely with uh, whole bunches. You've also got um, Britannia, who are, I'm going to put them there, I think that's about right. But uh, down here at the bottom of the screen, you can probably just see the words Chili, as in Chili Les Cito, and there's a new industrial complex there just across the railway line where you've got several top producers. You've got Laurent Ponceau in his own new business. You have got the Australian Mark Heismer, uh, who is pleasingly irreverent. And um, he's got some Bourgogne, but he's got a couple of sort of generic cuvées, which are Bourgogne Grand Ordinaire or maybe even Bourgogne. And uh, uh, he, he messes around, you see a signpost to Silly Le Chito, it's the Silly Git idea, instead of Silly Le Chito on it. Uh, Domaine Borso and Chambol have moved down there, and one other key producer is uh, Dominique Laurent in his negociant business which these days runs under the uh, radar because he doesn't use the same form of uh, distribution as most other people do. 
Um, he doesn't care about uh, being talked about all the time. He made his splash when he started with his sort of 200% new oak and his fact that um, he decided to make wine because he didn't like anybody else's wine and he decided to become a barrel um, supplier because he didn't like anybody else's barrels and so on and so forth. So, you know, he, he, he's a pretty punchy individual, as indeed is Laurent Ponceau, as indeed is Mark Heisman. Um, so, um, but uh, nothing wrong with that, uh, as long as people are making good wine, as all three of those are. Right, I think that's going to be, just check and see if uh, any more uh, questions have come through. Um, right, Mark, you're going to have to, uh, and they're not a disaster, the A6s from Barto or other people, but I do, don't like the vintage as much as I normally do from Chambord. Uh, so you're going to have to have a little look, look about. Um, and you also asked, where is Derrière Lagrange? And it is, uh, I'll just get my, it's this one here, that's, um, uh, too small, it just gets a, a number two on it. Um, used to belong entirely to the main Louis Remy, but when that got split up, it went some to Confurent Quotidio and some to Dubon, maybe? Can't remember for sure. Um, what's quite interesting is as you close in on the village, it's actually well below the level of the road, and whoever is currently running that Abbot of Vineyard has trained the vines quite a lot higher as a result. Right. Um, and Clint wants to know how I compare Chambol Musnier and Volnay in style. Well, Chambol is the Volnay of, nor of the north, and the, or Volnay is the Chambol of the south. Neither of them have got a water course, either now or in previous times, really running through the, um, uh, the village. Uh, there's not much uh, clay in the soil, they're much more limestone. Uh, they are actually, they don't, uh, the active limestone means that the vine leaves are often a little bit. Oh, thank you, Mark. It's Amy Isabel, the other one, sorry. Um, then uh, uh, slightly lighter coloured, both in the foliage and sometimes also in the, in, in the wines. They are both villages which revolve more about um, fruit plus acidity than fruit plus tannins. Chambol is suave, more serene, uh, more sensual. Volnay, a little bit a little bit more, more savoury, if you like, a little bit more rough silk. Apart from the very best vineyards in Chambol, I'm not sure that the Volnais don't last even better than the, the Chambol or so. Uh, and it's too early really to know how the Barto wines are in Chambol's hands. They, they all did it. It was communal effort. I haven't tasted the 2019s. He's not going to, he's going to follow on from uh, uh, what happened before. Maybe further down the road he might introduce some extra ideas, but he has no intention of, of breaking the mould. Uh, they didn't make their wines that differently, his mother and his father. Um, they taste a little bit different each time, and it, incidentally, Louis Boyot's wines are really under the radar because people know about Chislain Barter and they don't go and see Louis Boyot. The domain suffers a tiny bit because they have vines in Pommard and Volnay from his Boyot heritage, plus also up in Chevre Chambertin and Fissin and so on. And so it, it's not quite a coherent domain from the point of view of an importer who wants to go to Chambord Musigny and get Chambord Musignys. Um, but in the last three to five years, I think wines have been really, really first class. Um, the cellar where his barrels mature is fractionally less cold than the cellar where Gislaine's mature, and that might make a little difference. Right, um, I am conscious that I need to be fair, and we're almost through a half hour, and we've done Chambord and we've done Vujo as well, in fairness. So, uh, Scott, can you bring me on the next map? Good um, Right. Here we are. Um, shall we zoom? Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. Hope everybody can see all of it. So we got the dual village, Von Romanet and Flagey Echezo. So uh, the village of Flagey Echezo is off the map, bottom right. You go another kilometer or two into the flatland. Uh, and there you've got. Um, Two or three really excellent domains. Um, Domain Rouget, uh, of course, Emmanuel Rouget. The new star of Coca Le Oiseau Fleuro, which the Fleuro part of the family concentrates on agriculture and in the, in the flatlands. The Coca has come from Maurice Saint Denis. 
uh, and and the Loisans must be the Loisans come from Bermrimine, which explains the holdings of significant holdings of that domain. Um, so, um, on, um, is there anybody else? Oh, there's also Dominique Laurent has his, with his son. They have their domain Laurent, and they're also based in Flagey, so maybe others too. Otherwise, Vaume Romani, so many great vineyards, so many um, wonderful uh, producers as well. I've drawn up a, a short list of the, the top 30, <laughs> and uh, everybody's got something going for them. So you can see the big block of uh, Echezo Grand Cru's on the right. You can see the rest of the block of the, uh, being a bit dismissive, saying the rest of the block of Vaume Romani. Grand Cruz, little things like La Romane, La Romane Conti, La Grand Rue, La Tache, the four monopolies, and then the two which get shared, Richebourg and Romane and saint vivant uh, And then you've got others which other people, people, many of us think could be uh, Grand Cruz as well, insofar as that they're at least as good as Grand Cruz from other villages. So let's have a little talk about them, and uh, I'll try and give you my opinion. Let's start with Les Souchot, which is sitting inside, um, well, between Echezo and Richebourg and Romain saint vivant um, The only thing about this is that you can see a little bit from the, um, the contour lines here uh, that it drops down. I and mean, certainly in the lower part, below the, uh, the Route de Grand Cru, which uh, goes through the middle of the three words of Les Souchot, um, certainly below that, there is quite a noticeable dip. As you go further up to the top, uh, then you have less of a dip, uh, and you, by the time you get up to the beginning of the top of, Re well, where Richebourg uh, 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 comes alongside, and um, up towards Brule, this little triangle at the top, you're on the flat land, and historically that was called Les Grands Souchot. It belongs, most of that belongs to Domaine Arnoux Lachaud, and they have asked for permission to be allowed to call theirs Grand Souchot, and they do again, and, uh, and they have been given that permission, I think possibly the 18, certainly the 19 vintage, um, and they are charging Grand Cru prices nowadays, uh, and it is a pretty spectacular wine. Uh, even prior to Charles Lachaud getting involved, his father, Pascal Lachaud, used to serve the Souchot after their Echezeau, because in his opinion, it was the better wine. Then we had Malkinsaw over here, perhaps not the bit called Eau de Sudo Malkinsaw, and with it, a couple of tiny bits of Gaudi show uh, next to La Tache, uh, sensational wine, very high prices being charged. Sure, that's Grand Cru quality. Croix-Vallo asks to be made into Grand Cru from time to time because it's a, it appears to be just a little bit taken out of Romanet Saint-Vivant. I don't know the wines well enough. Um, I taste them at La Marche and the two other uh, producers who own some. Um, what I've seen, I don't think it, I mean, uh, um, it wouldn't be my, I don't think it stands out as the best of the Premier Cruz at La Marche, so, so I would say no to that one. Uh, and now we've got three vineyards up here, above Romanet and Richebourg, which are Aurigno, sensational wine, of course, from um, Louis-Michel Lichet Belair, uh, Petit Mont, a number of people making really good wine, and a thing called Cro Perron too, uh, which we will come to uh, uh, in a second. Uh, Reno and Petit Mont would be candidates if you really need to add more uh, Grand Cru's, uh, then they're pretty much up there. Cro Parentu, it's often cited as being, well, that's obviously going to be Grand Cru because think of the wine or made, et made, etc. etc. Um, I'm in two minds about it, and about a month ago, I went and walked all around the vineyard and really tried to get more of a feel of it. Um, its fame is because of this Jaya connection, uh, but much of it was fallow in the years around about the Second World War, and Jaya planted it himself, had to use a bit of dynamite to, uh, to get the um, vines in. It had been, uh, I think they'd been growing Jerusalem artichokes there uh, before. But actually, this vineyard, uh, a little bit of it is facing east or northeast, uh, but a lot of the slope drops down to the north. And this bit of land here, which is Mayo Chemise holding, is actually quite a bit lower down than this here, which is that's very, very rough um, grading between the two. 
which is the Rouget holding. <clears throat> when I went to see both of them for the first edition of my book, um, uh, Crow was uh, explained as, as, as being very good news by uh, one of those producers and the other said, uh, it stands for Crow, i.e. a dip. And I said, well, is there a dip in Crow Power 2? And he said, not in my part. <clears throat> but in fact, there's um, uh, about uh, here, these two join, there is a little stand of trees and it is more in a dip below. And I used to find, tasting the young wines at Mayo Camusé, <clears throat> that in most years I preferred the Brule to the Crow Parentu, but the reputation in the marketplace was the other way around because of shame. 2018, for the first time it was the opposite. I thought the Crow Parentu was utterly spectacular and much the best ever and was really magical wine. It was very, very good from Rouge as well. Um, but I think it's because this is a vineyard which has benefited from the global warming. Being in a dip, the slightly deeper soil, slightly humid perhaps, uh, that didn't count anymore in 18 and presumably subsequently. And we may be about to see the very best years of the Mayo say Crow Parent too. Interestingly, the soils look different. And of course, it could be because they had ploughed recently between the two domains. But you could see a darker coloured soil, slightly more clay, but also some definite um, chips of, of, of limestone. Uh, down below in the American Camusé bit, whereas it was a much lighter, lighter coloured and a lighter texture of soil, more friable soil, in the um, uh, Rouget bit. So I shall follow that with interest and see where we go thereafter. Um, Rouge du dessous can make some lovely wines for you up at the top. I, I, have a, I do enjoy Brûlée, and what was quite interesting, Brûlée, this word meaning burnt, was in 2018, most of the um, examples I tasted in cask, and that's quite a few in all, did have the smell of burnt rock almost, like if you click two bits of um, flint together, as we used to do when I was a boy and growing up in Hampshire with lots of flint around, and you want to make the sparks fly, and it would leave you with a singe smell, and it got an element of that in some of the 2018 brulees. And I love Les Beaumont, a uh, really, really uh, generous, sensual, exuberant, but also with a nice mineral quality behind um, uh, uh, vineyard. I like that a lot. And there's a little bit up here, um, Les Hauts Beaumont, which belongs to um, Bruno Clavelier, and he's actually had to wire his up, electric wire all around, because um, the wild boar come down from above and uh, eat that vineyard, give him half a chance. And he said that one year he saw that the mother boar, being followed by her piglets, the mother boar went and lay on the um, uh, electric fence straight barbed wire uh, to allow all the little piglets to get over the top so they could go and feed. And she sort of took one for the team. Uh, greater love hath no uh, wild boar. Um, Another interesting uh, village vineyard is Les Barreaux, um, which is on a steep slope, but part of the slope comes down to the east and part of the slope goes uh, almost due north. Um, and uh, it's a nice cuvee from Anne Gros, and also um, a fair amount of the village from Romain de Orangeier made came from Les Barreaux. Champ Perdries, it tends to be in other places also in uh, in Burgundy is high on the hill where the partridges used to nest in the, in the scrubland. Uh, so it's very much a limestone, uh, quite mineral, quite fresh uh, vineyard. Um, Bruno Clare's uh, Champ Perdry is bolstered because he has such a small bit of rain here that it's not worth doing on its own and it goes into Champ Perdry. Um, but obviously the bulk of the Vaughan vineyards are uh, down here in the lower land and also uh, not sure if we can move it over, can't quite see, but also you've got some more village friend Romane below um, what is Premier Cru Nuit Saint Georges, thanks. Oreas, well known, next to the Clodo Reas, belonging to Michel Gros. Uh, you are a little bit damper here, Odyssey, just above the river and the Fontaine de Vaughan, uh, those areas, and you can see we've got a bit of a stream coming out of that. Um, I like this, uh, also the area around Maisier here, there's lots of good stuff. But as somebody said back in 1660, there are no common vines in Von Romanet. 
Uh, oh, the producers. Well, five star. Um, Rainer Romani Conti, Loire, Complice Belair. No real questions about that. Um, uh, Andy, I haven't yet tasted with Anna and Sophie, so I haven't tasted their barrow. That's still to come. Uh, I also think that Charles Lachaud's wines at Domain Anu uh, Lachaud are heading firmly into five star territory. Um, there's also, uh, I think, to be five star, you've got to have a, a range of Grand Cru's. Um, but you know, close behind, I love the wines are in their completely different styles, but I think Grivo, Meo Camusay, Katia, Nire Chibourg, Cocalos en Fleuro, Jeanne Fizeau, all those are definitely up there. Um, I'm a bit less experienced with Rouget. Um, they're pretty good too. And some of the wines that Maxime Chalin has made at Domaine Georges and all that are unquestionably right up there. Um, and I think we're about to see more consistency that would have been my criticism of three or four years ago, that the wines weren't yet as consistent enough to be up there in that very high bracket. Uh, Angro, the wines haven't really changed enormously from um, the reputation that she gained when she took over from her father, so they're still clearly very good wines. I was a bit less keen on Michel Gros, but my last visit was very promising, um, and so I think there's, there's good stuff there, and they have less need of the concentrating machine. I don't really understand what ha what's happening at Grove Frere, sir, um, but they have at long last started to plough their vines rather than using um, uh, uh, herbicides. Um, uh, Miriam, I shall get to La Marche. I've got my little list in front of me, just working through. Bruno Clavelier is sort of biodynamic and a um, um, whole bunch, as is uh, Jean-Pierre Guillon. The wines come out quite differently because Jean-Pierre picks quite a bit later, whereas Bruno likes a very fresh style. I'm actually very fond of the, uh, the wines of both of them. Uh, my favourite wine from Bruno Clavelier is going to be his Chambon Musigny Comme d'Orvo, and my favourite wine from Jean-Pierre Guillon is his Von Romanet on Orvo, or perhaps his Echeso, which also comes from the Orvo sector. Um, usually um, have struggled to gain popularity because of the extraordinary love for Domaine Angel, so some people have refused to even to look at what Eugenie have done, but it's a, and it's a completely different style. So if you remember those vineyards as Eugenie vineyards, then you uh, sorry as Angel vineyards, then you may not enjoy so much what's going on. But they're impressive wines in a stricter, uh, little bit oakier style, a little bit firmer style, slightly darker fruit than Philippe Angel used to do, uh, but they're pretty classy and like in Philippe's time. It's still uh, a battle from one vintage to the next as to whether or not the Claude Boucher uh, or the Grand Session Say will be the winner. And having declassified some plants that they felt were less good, they're making a very smart brulee as well. Um, we mentioned Minoret Giborg in passing, but I think everybody's familiar with uh, them. But don't overlook the cousin Gerard Minoret, who's now Pascal at the helm some really good wines coming uh, out of that domain. Of course, they share crop a little bit for Minerai Gibourg. Um, La Marche, the wines are very elegant, very stylish. They're exactly what um, Nicole La Marche wants to make. Uh, I unfortunately ended up having a, having a bit of a, a battle with her when we were in Hong Kong at the beginning of the year, and it was entirely my fault. I expressed myself badly. What I was trying to say was that she was not making show pony style of wines that were sort of rich and glossy and you know going to win medals and would be sort of easy to appreciate. She's definitely trying to make wines which are fine and elegant and balanced and she thought I was saying that her wines weren't in the top class because they weren't sort of rich enough and I wasn't trying to say that at all. I was trying to say that it was not the style which uh, you know, might get um, you know, a, a medal in the Adelaide show or something uh, uh, was, was the only point I was trying to make. Um, not so well known, but I think both pretty good. Uh, Regis Forêt and definitely coming up in the world with the uh, son or grandson, depending on which generation you knew, uh, Edouard at Confrangin. Those are worth taking a look at. There's Guillaume Tardy, who suffers a little bit like Louis Boyot from the fact that he's got one wine from each village instead of having a, a, a big base in, uh, uh, in Bonne Romanée. Confrangin Cotetido will divide 
um, opinions because of their very late pick, all whole bunch style. Um, and uh, their wines, which really need age, I think, to show what they're about. I don't know, I haven't visited Sarug or Michel Nola recently, and I haven't either visited the, uh, the sort of joint domain of uh, the daughter of one of those and the son of the other, uh, who are together as partners, and uh, they're starting to make some wines, which uh, people are talking about, they haven't got there yet. I don't really get on with Montjean Mineray, even though they're very popular in some marketplaces. I went and did a big tasting there last year. There's something about the choice of barrel that doesn't quite work uh, for me. Um, some of the wines are certainly good, but, but they're not in my front line. And I've never tasted anything from Domaine Chevalier with two L's. So, oh, uh, who else? We've got the Cachers, and I've tasted their wines at shows and liked them, but uh, without putting them in the top category. Jack Cacher and René Cacher, um, and uh, uh, I should get around to seeing them. And there's a little place on the main road, Odifred, I'm not sure how you pronounce them. Uh, I tasted two or three of their wines. Uh, people try and discover them from time to time because they're uh, off the beaten track. Um, but again, I wouldn't place them at the top. And there's also Armel and Bernard Rion, and now I think four members of the younger generation are all involved. Um, and uh, I, I ought to get back there as well. Um, so, so that's a rundown of pretty much everybody in um, Verona Romanée. And that's, oh, I forgot um, there was also um, uh, Fabrice Vigo, uh, and there's Natalie Vigo as well. Uh, Fabrice Vigo um, was the other sharecropper for. Uh, Mini Reggie Vogue, but he, he handed in his cards for that and stopped doing that. Um, yeah, so let me just see. Um, all right, so focus on Beaumont, we live in the same name. Yes, right. Uh, I'm just checking if there's any other questions. Um, Keith, the essential difference, if any, between the two sides of Brule, uh, I think it's going to depend on some people that are on both sides. Um, I've been meaning to draw myself a map and get everybody nailed down. I would say from what I've seen so far that I think the house style is more different than a clear view between the two sides. Um, Cheryl wants to know about the uh, femininity, no, femininity of Chambord versus Vaughan. I have tried to avoid using feminine and masculine as descriptors. Um, I think it's fine if it comes from uh, a female, but it is sometimes taken as being uh, male chauvinism if you, if you insist that wine is a feminine wine or a masculine wine. Um, but typically people have often called Chumbal and indeed Volney more feminine and Pomar and Chevrolet more masculine. Chumbal's got the elegance, not always the intensity. What Von Romanet has got is it's got the greatest intensity of all. And it's got this um, real uh, sort of heady, hedonistic class to the bouquets as well. So it's not the same bouquet as Chambord Musnay, but it's got the upside of what Chambord can offer, but it's also got a greater intensity uh, thereafter. And I have to say also, so far, it's not one of the villages where I've seen anything to worry about from the greater heat of recent days. We'll see, you know. Got to monitor that, but just at the moment, I'm still feeling feeling pretty positive uh, about uh, Von Romanet. Good. Um, so, what are we doing? Where well, timing looks about right, uh, and I'm going to press on and uh, this is my tea, silver needle white tea today. A bit too early for me to start drinking wine. Um, and we've got another village, we have Nuit Saint-Georges, we have three appellations rolled into one. Um, one is fairly obvious insofar as it's a village of Premo, and uh, I might use this uh, just to um, let's draw a line. So here is the line down from Premo, and Probably I would draw the boundary if one were to separate it out as a separate appellation. Let's use the other the line is easier. I might draw it down there. Some people think that, no, I'm going to clear that. Let's do it again. Um, Forêt, 
might be more real. It's it's on the cusp between Premo style and real Nuit Saint Georges. Les Didier, I think, is is full on central Nuit Saint Georges. Terre Blanche, definitely not. Pedri, Corvée, blah blah blah. All the rest are <clears throat> um, Premo style, Premier Cruise. One slight anomaly in closer mark, which I'll, I'll come to. Then you've got your centre, and then of course over here you've got your moving on towards Ven Remedy. <clears throat> <clears throat> um, you can see two vineyards in a different colour here, Honoré and Les Vignottes. That's because they are just under the classification of Côte Nuit Village, as was uh, Les Terres Blanches here. Uh, I've got too many different things all, all labelled up. But Terre Blanche until 1984 used to be Côte Nuit Village, these two are. And then if you go into Comblanchien and Corganois, you are purely Côte Nuit Village. So also you have some Côte de village vineyards at the northern end of the Côte. You have Brochon, half of that, and anything that's in Fissin can be declassified into Côte de village if you want to. There's a view that they're going to turn the Brochon vineyards into Appalachian Fissin. Gra, who Mark Carrington, who's, who's uh, listening in, knows well, uh, Damien uh, Gachot of uh, Gachot Mono, um, is in charge of the Côte de village sort of um, appellation and he would love to see all the ones down here at this end promoted into Nuit Saint-Georges which I think is not going to happen but it might be there could be a movement towards trying to make a single appellation out of these two vineyards Vignot and Lerre plus Comblanchien plus Corbinois I don't know I'm, I'm, I'm getting ahead of, of what's planned um, <clears throat> so typically these vineyards at the Premo end <coughs> um, are all on a slightly lighter soil, uh, on top of the limestone, not too much clay. It's an area where you need not to extract too much to get the best out of it, which is why the Clé de la Marechale, I think, is working much better with um, Fred Nunier's Chambon Musigny style vinification than it did before with Francois Fauvelet's rather more powerful extraction. Clé de Lalo is, uh, is very much also a case in point of a light and perfumed crew, which would be a disaster if you tried to do too much with it. As you start to move north, you can maybe put in a little bit more. Terre Blanche, it shouldn't be a premier crew in my opinion. It was Coutinho Village. They asked for it to be upgraded to New Saint George. The authorities looked at it and said, um, well, uh, that will be tricky because we'll have to jump through all sorts of hoops to do a double promotion. Uh, sorry, to, to, to even to promote it to Marie Saint Georges. But there's a little bit of Clodalalo here, which doesn't have vineyards. It is just a quarry. It's officially Premier Cru, it doesn't have vineyards. No one's going to plant vines there, though somebody since has. <clears throat> they added lots of t um, uh, soil and planted some. So they took away the Premier Cru uh, from here and they put it into um, Terre Blanche instead. Now, Terre Blanche, as the name suggests, is actually much more of a white wine um, uh, soil. It makes some of the best white wines from Louis Saint George. You could argue it's valid as Premier Cru for whites, but the reds are pretty insipid and it should only be village from uh, Louis Saint George at best. Um, <clears throat> there's an oddity here in Clos Saint Mar, uh, which is a monopoly of domain um, Petrus Rion, Chien Petrus Rion in that it's a little bit dropped down. Uh, it's got a richer, deeper soil. It's got a little bit more in common than Vaughan Romanet in some ways, or at least with the vineyards in Rue Saint-Georges on the Vaughan side, than it has for the rest of the promo bit. Um, so uh, the other thing that's quite interesting is that um, along here, you've got, it's Clos de la Maréchal, Clos de Lalo, Clos des Agilières, Clos Saint-Marc, Clos des Grands Vignes, Clos des Corvées, uh, uh, Claude de Perdry, Claude de Forêt Saint Georges, Claude um, Le Didier, it all belongs to the Hospice Nuit, but it's not so much for Claude. So that all Claude's, and most of them are monopolies of one person. You've also got lots of little dividers, not necessarily just between the vineyards, which are exactly a mile apart, because this was once a Roman road, and the Romans put in some drainage, and Romans did miles, they hadn't converted to metric. So they're a mile apart rather than a kilometer apart or anything like that. We'll come into the middle part uh, and take a look at these names here. Les Saint-Georges, Les Vaucrins, Les Cailles, Les Poirets, Les Pouliers, probably enough Francaise on its own, it doesn't have a Les, Les Procès, Les Creux, 
les poulettes, les veucrins, etc., etc. And compare with these vineyards here, aux Zagila, aux Torre, aux Bousselot, aux Vignerondes, aux Chéniaux, aux Manger, aux Boudot, aux, aux, aux Cras. Um, for some reason, they just decided, maybe to help differentiate, that most of the vineyards north of Mise Saint Georges, heading towards Vain Romanet, are all called AUX, going to the vineyard, whereas south of Mise Saint Georges, they're just the vineyard, um, a curiosity. So the deepest, most powerful um, clay based soil and the deepest, most powerful wines are this sector here, particularly Les Saint Georges, Les Cailles. Le Vaucrin as well for the power, but a tiny bit less clay-based because you're going further up the hill. So there isn't the same depth of soil. I've included as well Perrier. Uh, it probably continues up as far as Prudier, but it's a little bit less obvious uh, as you go further north. These are what most people regard as classic Moussin Georges. They're really powerful, they're dark colored, they have loads of tannins, but such a volume of fruit. They're also mostly owned by people in Louis Saint Georges and they're often cheaper, um, partly because it was sort of a commercial centre and people were always haggling about prices. But vignerons who live in Louis Saint Georges charge less for their wines than vignerons who live in Fon Romanet and used to charging Fon Romanet prices. And vignerons in Promo seem to be a little bit in between the two. You don't get a real feeling of Vaughan Romanet when you're in Agila, Autore, Bousselot, Champerdry, maybe not even Vigneron, Chaigneau, the first signs, but once you get into Damoud, Merger, Richemont, uh, Rest Damoud, Cra, and especially Boudot, Boudot's next to Malcolm Saw, you're getting the depth and weight from Louis Saint Georges, but you're also getting a certain amount of that incredible hedonistic bouquet of Vaughan Romanet. And if you can find them not at Vaughan Romanet prices, uh, then you've got yourself a deal. But typically they often are at Vaughan Romanet prices. Super village wines are on here as well. Obadicom, uh, you don't often see Barrier on its own. And Lavier would be two picks for village, Louis Saint-Georges. Uh, and also along this line, Ozalo and the Charmottes are pretty good as well. Um, so, that's a rundown within Louis Saint Georges. Uh, I've talked very briefly also about um, the, the blocks of where the producers come from, um, but to single out a few, Gouge and Chevillon for, forever have been the classics in uh, Louis Saint Georges itself. Gouge, typically really, really long lasting, really tannic wines. They're a bit lighter now, uh, but they're still powerful beasts uh, and even though they may be a bit lighter, my feeling is that they will age just as well. And I'm always really pleased when I see people making wine for the long term. Uh, Chevillon was a lighter style, and when the current brothers, um, Bertrand and Denis, took over uh, from their father, <clears throat> I thought the style was a tiny bit too light. It might have been a question of replanting. I used to find the fruit at the front end of the palette, and they didn't quite kick on. <clears throat> last 10 or 15 years it's been totally different and they have this sensuality but the fruit goes all the way to the back of the palette and it's a really excellent address with a whole range of different uh, premier crews. <clears throat> um, also in the village of Mie Saint-Georges, um, uh, Alex uh, Mio of Domaine Jean-Marc Mio has moved into Mie Saint-Georges, he's making some uh, pretty good wines, um, very good wines. Um, Somebody has seen the praises the other day to me of Chicoteau that I haven't visited. You've got uh, Marchand Tours and Domain Tours based in Louis Saint Georges. There are several members of the Gavignet family, of whom I think Philippe Gavignet is the one who I've seen the wines of most often, and they're good and they're not expensive. Um, uh, Thibault Ligébelaire, based in Louis Saint Georges, he's moved out of his cramped space into a really exciting modern cuverie with. Uh, solar panels providing uh, lots of the um, uh, energy, if not all the energy. He, he's got a huge, great sort of solar star that moves around, follows the sun around just outside. He's designed his own shape of tanks so that they're nearly square tanks because that's the most effective space for using um, the room in the winery. But they've got little rounded corners so you don't have the, 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 the edges where, where wine can get trapped or 
solids can get trapped and that stop the circulation of the wine. He also builds his own barrels, uh, pretty much. He, he chooses his own wood and he takes over one particular cooper for two days um, in September normally. And he, he, with the cooper, they build the barrels according to his design of what he, what he wants for that year and what he wants, what type of toast he wants for each cuvee. <clears throat> My only criticisms he likes when he calls the chef blonde or the chef tartare, are you hardly any tasting more than I do because I think that, that leaves some green tannins in the barrel, um, which does show in the wine afterwards. It's a, it's, a, it's a cheerful, friendly argument that we have every time I see him. But uh, Thibaut is, is a fascinating guy, and uh, he makes some super wines, very much like his Charmotte. And also, just up here, just off the map, uh, I'm going to have to annotate again, I think. Um, <clears throat> he makes a truly extraordinary Aligote, um, it's got a single vineyard name, which includes the word Perrier, I can't remember the full name, uh, <coughs> which he makes. Um, you can join me on the, I think, the 27th, um, so Thursday next week on the 67 Pal Mal site when I'm doing an Eligote Fest and we're having that wine. And there's so much happening in the world of Eligote that it's, please, please, please uh, do join in that and get the wines. Um, uh, Pay up for the wines to be sent to you from 67 Pound Mal, and we'll have a wonderful time. Um, uh, Patrice Rion, I've been selling his wines for, um, that's um, Thibaut, you should really have that, Michael. Patrice um, Rion, I sold his wines, I first bought the 1979 vintage commercially, 79s and 80s, and made wonderful 80s, still good today. Uh, and I went on until I retired from commerce in 2017. And everybody who bought the wines from me always enjoyed them, but they never got good press from anybody. They got absolutely nice criticisms, but they were never thought of as superstars. Uh, so the radar has never been challenged. And yet it's now a nearly 40 year track record of really nice winemaking. Uh, and I've got plenty in my cellar, which I bring out with evident enjoyment. Um, others we haven't mentioned uh, Jean Claude Boisset. Uh, state-of-the-art new winery in Rue saint georges which has even planted vines on top of the winery. They've, they, it's got a, um, a um, convex roof which they put some earth on top and they've planted lots of different types of Chasselas grapes for fun on top. Um, Le Chenot I need to visit um, but a chap who, who worked there and learned a lot from them called Vincent Ledy is uh, one of the names that's beginning to be talked about. Um, up in the hills, but uh, in the in the oak coat, you've got Claire Nodin, who I think of, I include a bit in Louis Saint Georges. You might also include David Dubon in Louis Saint Georges, uh, who's first class. And then you've got the people in Vougeray, which are um, in Vougeray, sorry, in Premo, um, Patrice Rian just mentioned, uh, Prieuré Rock who won't allow a journalist to come and taste, and in fact doesn't, I think, do any barrel tastings. Uh, but I've, the wines are, are about as natural as it gets for mainstream Burgundy. Um, I can't remember having had a deviant one, and I've had several uh, with a fair amount of age. They cost a lot of money, but they are very, very good. Um, uh, and uh, you've then got Domaine Le Vougeray, which you will know I'm a big fan of. Um, when Pierre Vincent started making the wines, cut down on the extraction, cut down on the oak, went up in a big way on the um, whole bunches. And even though he's left, they're being made in the same way. And they've got a number. They don't have many vineyards in Louis Saint Georges itself, but uh, they're making a range of wonderful wines. Grand Cru whites from the Cote de Bone, um, reds from all over. Chom Chomptin, Masria, probably my favorite. And guess what? I've left out one of the absolute top, top people, uh, huge, well, not huge, but big producer, Favoli. Um, since Awan Favoli took over, there was that dramatic change in style. They then flicked back over a little bit um, from 2007. Uh, initially, the wines came over as lighter in color, very floral, very juicy, very succulent, very easy to approach. And from about 2011, they've decided that maybe they were heading, the pendulum had swung a bit too much, and they reintroduced some good 
uh, structure into the wines. And people who attended my Corsant tasting two nights ago, uh, we had a 2014 Corsant Chaudé, Corsant Fauvelet, which have plenty of structure and real ageability while still being attractive. Uh, and Erwin Fauvelet is somebody who's, who's really easy to talk to. Uh, he's very open. Um, when I went and tasted the 2018 sir, he had a little spreadsheet with him which, in which he'd analysed any risk of um, uh, sort of volatile acidity and or uh, brethnomyces. He, he's got the analysis of all the wines, talks about the ones where it's more difficult and he'd had to clean them up and so on and so forth. So he's not the sort who, who, who's trying to hide behind uh, past glories. Right, I think we can, we can kill the maps uh, then, Scott. And I'm just going to have a little check on the chat and the questions. Um, yeah, Miriam, I imagine you're talking about uh, Rion. That's great if you, if you still do. Uh, Michael, the growers can't shoot the wild boar eating the crops. At least officially they can't, uh, I'm afraid. Apologies for that. My thoughts on the whites of me, Sir George. Good question. Um, I was asked by an American publication um, to, um, uh, wine enthusiast it was, to do a piece on the white wines of the Saint George. And they had a sort of reasonably strict um, uh, editorial guidance. They said, okay, what we're sort of really looking for is who's doing it really well, but also what is it about the particular terroirs in the Saint George that say this bit should be white? Um, and I said, well, it's going to be really tricky to do that because, frankly, people have typically planted, first of all, it came back by accident because of the Gouge Pinot Noir that uh, converted itself unexpectedly into Pinot Blanc. And secondly, uh, it's happened because people have got too much red Mise Saint Georges to sell and they just want to make a bit of white. Um, so apart from that Terre Blanche, which is clearly white wine territory, most of Mise Saint Georges is for red wine. I have no objections to it. It works. The wines have got a little bit more character than most white bone has got. Um, but as long as it's a minority and that we don't see wholesale moving to white, um, it's, it's fine. But um, we have just had a call in. Uh, I'm not sure if I know how to do this, but let me just see if I can do this. We have a hand uh, raised. Ah, yes, a non of attendee has asked about the, the white Pinot Gouge clone. I have just answered that uh, by chance. Um, so uh, it, it just happened one day. They went into the vineyards and saw what used to be producing red had suddenly started uh, producing white. And they don't know why it happened, but they cloned them and produced a lot more. Um, and uh, that's what happened. Uh, in theory, um, my friend John Beaver Truax is on the line. I think uh, if you unmute yourself, you should be able to ask a question. Are you with us, Beaver? No? Scott, you may need to do that. I may not have the right to do that. If not, um, Beaver, ask your question on the, uh, on, on the chat. Because I don't think... No. Hello? Oh, Louis Michel, Liget Belair white wine, white Nuit Saint George. Oh yeah, the 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 Clos de Grand Vin. Uh, the reason he's got that is because um, after it got sold in two thousand and five, uh, it was sold to Etienne de Monti, who then passed it across to his Chateau du Pirenee Marché, and uh, he decided to put in a sector of it as white because he thought that's quite a lot of red to sell, and it would be interesting where it is, let's just try it. Uh, and so he then sold the vineyard on to Louis Michel de Chevalier. I've tasted it once, maybe twice. Uh, I haven't got in the front of my mind an exact memory of it. But um, yeah, uh, you know, Louis Michel de Chevalier doesn't make bad wine. So I don't think I'm gonna have time to, uh, to try and um, check out a tasting note. Um, but there should be one, particularly the 2018, probably 2017 on, on my website. Brian, thank you for the question. Um, any, anyone else got any other thoughts? Um, Michael, can you remind me what Aligotti just outside of New St. George enjoy so much? It was the one on the uh, Thibault Liger Belair's one, and I've forgotten the name of the vineyard. But as, I, as I say, if you join me from Seven Palmel on Thursday next week, then you will uh, 
um, you will get that. Uh, you'll, you'll get the, uh, we will talk our way through six different truly exciting elegotes. Yeah, and Michael, I'm sorry, we just can't get you the samples in, in, in uh, the US. It was tried and the uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms or their current version either uh, destroyed them or at least send them back. So I'm, I'm so sorry about that, but it is outside, outside our control. Wonderful. Well, I have slightly overrun the time that I said I was going to. Um, and uh, I'm going to get outside again, gonna maybe have another look at the vineyards. Um, we'll see you this time next week. Join in again when we're going to be talking about burgundy pricing, about the 2019 crop, the 2020 crop. Uh, I'm very fortunate to be um, pretty much uh, the only critic or one of the very few critics who is actually based here in Burgundy so despite all the lockdown I've been able to get around and see everybody and uh, away we'll go. And I'd like to thank my colleague Scott in, in Hong Kong who's been uh, managing things behind the scenes. So thank you all and see you next time. Bye.